And now the survival show that once survived, spray tanning a parrot for a bodybuilding competition. So weird. In this episode, Justin Carroll from Across the Peak podcast drops by. We ponder what it means to be competent and the dangers of seeking to become an expert. Howdy and welcome to In the Rabbit Hole's Urban Survival Podcast. This is episode number 286. I'm your host, Aaron, and you are in the rabbit hole. Safe and sound. Justin, welcome back to the rabbit hole. Aaron, what's going on, man? Man, I'm excited to be sitting here chatting it up with you about a deep topic today. A really deep topic, as a matter of fact. Hopefully we do it some justice. I hope so too, man, because this is a topic I am pretty passionate about. I have a podcast that I describe as we call ourselves generalists every single time. And I, I'm all about this topic, man. And I think to so to set the tone, it uh, for anybody who missed the intro today, we are going to be discussing what does it mean to be a competent adult and a competent prepper. And this can become very tricky. And we'll start it off at a very high level and then work through some practical stuff. But I think from a from from a high level where uh, someone is an expert, and this is something I often wrestle with, where somebody is an expert and they have very deep, specialized knowledge in a specific area versus competent, which is merely just somebody who can get things done. And there is a very wide gulf between those two things. And I think for me, and we were just, you and I were just talking about this a second ago, uh, Justin, that for me, I have a bad tendency to uh, I'll get excited about a new thing and then I'll become obsessed about it. And it's like, I want to become an expert and I will spend so much time trying to do that, that it ends up being at the exclusion of everything else. Um, you know, and I think one of the other things that people, uh, and this has been so abused, if we use like the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hour rule, or if you translate that into eight hour days, I think it's like, 1250 days doing a thing and and i heard somebody not too long ago in within even the survival community and they're like i've done this thing for ten thousand hours therefore i am now an expert and a master at it and it's like that's not really what that means just simply doing a thing for ten thousand hours does not make you a master of it or an expert i mean you certainly you have enough experience that you're probably very good at it uh or better than the average bear will say but to say that you're a master of it is is and I think that's it's it's not accurate because the the idea behind that and there were some other things that disproved that and there were some nuances and people want to argue about what that rule really means. But in a nutshell, having to spend most people that truly attain like a super high level of proficiency or mastery over a thing spend 10,000 hours. But the caveat is. There are often issues where there has to be a natural ability um, to to really reach the pinnacle of it. And then there also must be a conscious system where that person is always attempting and paying attention to whether or not they're improving. And that often involves putting metrics in place or sometimes um, and often even having a third party uh, guiding and making sure that you're not missing things like having a coach like. If you're going to super serious about physical fitness, like having a personal trainer to, OK, it's not just that you're doing 100 pushups, it's that you're doing 100 pushups correctly and not blowing out your shoulder or something ridiculous. So for me, I think the, the danger becomes with trying to be an expert in anything to do, and we'll just put it in the realm of preparedness or just you know, put it in life, trying to become an expert, if you put it in the concept of needing to put in that much time and that much focus or deep work to uh to to use uh uh Cal Newport's term on the subject you do it at the exclusion of everything else um what are your thoughts on that because i know you've you've had a long standing uh position of wanting to be a generalist so how has how has balancing that that de- the difference between expert and generalist been for you Justin well I guess I'm of two minds here because I'm certainly not immune to the allure of being really, really good at something. And and sometimes it's that I want to be really good at a thing. And sometimes it's that thing just captures my interest and imagination. Mm -hmm. And as long as it holds my interest, 
I will just keep going further and further down that rabbit hole until I get bored with it and abandon and find the next thing that captures my interest. So that's happened with a couple different things in my life. Uh, Lock picking was one of those for, dude, like four years, man. I uh, lived alone in an apartment every night that I wasn't doing something. I was at home reading books about locks, Googling locks, watching lock picking videos. Um, just learning everything I possibly could on the subject. And then one day I, I was just like, yeah, I kind of got this to go any further is going to require like massive financial investment or massively more time investment. And I'm done. Um, <laughs> and just wash my hands of that. I think podcasts is kind of an instructive example here. And the advice for podcasters usually is find a, a really, really niche topic. And that's how you find a niche, loyal, targeted, focused avatar for your audience. And I've, I listen to a lot of podcasts and I like that because I listen to shows on you know, personal finance, listen to shows on preparedness, on firearms. The thing I don't like about this is there's no balance. Uh, the, the personal defense trainer that's doing a podcast will tell you you need to spend your week doing five days a week at the range and you know the other three days a week in the dojo and you know, the physical fitness guy is like, no, you need to spend like two hours every day at the gym. The personal finance guy is like, you need to live in a tent and save 95% of your income. Uh-huh. So trying to find that balance, there's a lot of competing priorities in life. I think there's also a lot of competing priorities if you're trying to be a well-rounded prepper. Um, and I, I, I think people, me included, when they immediately get into prepping or start thinking about it, they zoom in on guns and ammo and backpacks. And a lot of other things get excluded Uh and, you know, just trying to bring some, a more well-rounded approach to this thing. So I guess to you, what is, what does competent mean? And it's such a hard, like I was trying to nail this down when I was working on, uh, when we had first talked about it and just, what is that? So what is, what does competent mean to you? And maybe we won't do better than just giving it kind of a, a, a fuzzy definition. I don't, yeah, I, I don't know that I can offer much more, like a whole lot of clarity on this, but I do love Dr. Jordan Peterson's, um, I guess, kind of credo that a human being should be competent and dangerous, uh, competent being capable and able to, uh, I guess, fulfill, you know, whatever their needs are. And, you know, we can kind of use Maslow's hierarchy of needs here as a, uh, you know, as a, as a metric, depending on what situation you're, you're in, if you're in a deep survival situation, just providing those basic physiological needs like oxygen and water, and food and uh, environmental protection, maintaining body temperature and all that stuff, um, competency would allow you to do that all the way up through the very, very highest tier of that, finding self-actualization and meeting those creative and moral needs and, and that sort of thing. Uh, I think competency is the, you know, kind of a ability throughout that entire spectrum of dirty, gritty, literally life or death activities, all the way up through these like more cerebral type activities that allows us to tick those boxes, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And I think one of the things that may get in people's way early on to finding competency and maybe so to, to, to bring it back in a little bit more is the idea that and it's something that that uh, sort of a note or a horse I've been beating to death this season, which is not focusing on a, a particular or singular event. So people, EMP is easy to pick on because that's a big one. People become obsessed with the idea that any day now we're going to get hit with an EMP. And so I need to be able to survive through what for effectively would end up being like the Stone Age for most of humanity, or at least that's that's the picture that gets painted of it. And then going back to the idea of exclusion, you you focus on that, um, on becoming just amazing at all these different things and trying to cover every last single base rather than just becoming competent enough to survive any situation, including the stuff that's likely to happen to you. And then, um, but by focusing too deeply, you miss out on all those other things like we were talking about self-actualization, which becomes this sort of, you know, uh, seemingly fluffy idea. But, you know, that can also be as much as paying enough attention to your wife or husband or kids or 
or the things that are in your immediate present situation that matter that also require your competency. So in the realm of survival and preparedness, I know you came up with a pretty good list of things. Let's start working through those as far as what are some things that really people should, in the sense of becoming a competent generalist, be focused on, and and I know that y'all actually cover a lot of this stuff in your show across the peak. So, uh, so you've had a good opportunity lately to really dive into some of these. But for you, what is that basic list of things that people should cover in their preparedness toolbox? Well, first of all, I I think kind of the attitude that you should approach preparedness with. And before we go into this, Aaron, I, I I'm certainly not the shining example of really any of these things. I, you know, I have time constraints and I get lazy and don't want to go to the gym and and everything else, just like everybody else. So I'm not uh, trying to hold myself up as I do all these things and I'm perfect at them and you should be like me. Um, But this is kind of how I think. Uh, I, I think attitude and general knowledge and is probably the most important thing you can have. And on the attitude side of that coin would be kind of this idea of rather than surround your or, or be so reliant on, yes, if there's an EMP, I have to get back to my house because it has, you know, EMP proofed, you know, metal trash cans full of radios that I'm going to barter or whatever, whatever the, whatever your thing is. And that is fine. That is a prudent thing to want to get back to your house. But uh, rather than focus so much on the equipment and, and be in this situation where if you don't have access to that, like, well, I'm, I'm screwed. I don't have anything. I kind of try to approach this as a train my mind and train my body to adapt to whatever situation comes uh, my way rather than have to have like this specific list of items. Uh, and And I think that's probably honestly a good way to approach just about anything in the, in the survival realm. Um, I I've always been a fan of, uh, you know, fire starting primitive fire starting techniques that don't require any kind of equipment whatsoever that you can basically just kind of scrounge up in the woods because that is the ultimate self-reliance. You don't need anything. If, if, uh, let's say you serve, you're lucky enough to survive a plane crash while well, your knife has been taken from you at security, it's in your check bag. It's probably not with you. Your lighter is probably broken and whatever. That's okay because you've trained your body and your mind to be able to overcome that particular adversity, if Hmm. that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. And I think that's starting with body. I mean, that is an important one. And it's one that is easy to overlook. And even going back to your point earlier about, hey, this is an ideal or a goal. It's not necessarily uh, something that I think either of us um, would would hold ourselves up and say we are the pinnacle of of any of these things because it's you know life happens and this goes back to why uh, being a generalist uh, and competent as opposed to an expert is important because otherwise it's it's unattainable to try to be all of these things all the time I and mean, that's one of the reasons why Hollywood movies about I don't know Jack Reacher or whoever are so entertaining because it the it it is that uh, that mythical achieve all things sort of situation. So in the world of physical fitness, where where do you draw the lines as far as just like what is competent? Well, I I think there has to be a balance of strength, stamina, and endurance, the ability to produce that strength, output that strength for you know over as long a time as possible, and some sort of cardio fitness. In any kind of disaster, in any kind of emergency, even if it's, you know, even if it's something without immediate, you know, you're not caught in the direct path of a hurricane, but it's some sort of, let's say the power goes out and is out for an extended period of time. There's going to be an added element of stress. There's going to be reduced climate control. There's going to be all these maybe reduced um, uh, foodstuffs and water and all these other things that if your body is physically fit, it's going to be much more equipped to deal with, let alone the, you know, we're actually running down the street away from the zombies or we're, you know, have to swim to safety or, or whatever it is. Yeah, those are, those situations certainly could happen in strength, endurance, stamina, cardio, fitness would all be awesome to have in those scenarios. Um, but anything from the ordinary mundane, the, you know, there's an accident on the highway and you're stuck in traffic for four hours, your body's going to cope with that stress differently. And I would contend better 
if you're physically fit than if you are not. And that stress is going to be present in any kind of emergency, uh, even if you're the person that is just hungry for this emergency to happen so you can live out your prepper fantasy. I promise <laughs> you, you will still be stressed. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think that's a good one. And I think it's something that and, you know, I think a, a lot of people will immediately poo poo that because they're like, oh, well, I'm in this situation. It is what it is. And it's like, OK, but you could do something. Um, and and I think even little things count every little thing you can do. I know for me, I work from home. Um, I don't get to get the physical exercise that I used to get. I just I just flat don't have time. I don't have time to go spend two hours in the gym, as you were saying. Uh, a second ago. And so it becomes like, I know one of the things that I'm looking at doing for 2019 is uh, getting a standing desk so that just I'm not sitting for nine, 10 hours a day. And some of the other things I've done is I've added, uh, which James Price used to make fun of me that I have a, a uh, one of the half Bosa ball things here in the office. And while I'm doing stuff or trying to study or just think about something, I'll go stand on the Bosa ball just so that I'm getting some sort of physical exercise beyond my ass sitting on in a chair um and so i think it, it even just little things that matter especially when it comes to physical fitness yeah and obviously this is a rabbit hole you could go down and end up you know spray tanning your body and oiling <laughs> yourself for bodybuilding competitions or yeah. running ultra marathons or there's 15 different directions you could go here mm -hmm. uh, but i think just a general level of not being overweight uh, being able to move some weight around and do that, you know, bug out bags are a prime example. And I, oh, I'm yeah. kind of on my high horse about this because I've been doing this a lot lately. But um, my my EDC bag that we talked about a few weeks ago, I am out with that thing probably at least once a week on some sort of, you know, one, two, three, four, sometimes five or six mile hike, um, actually getting out and using that thing. If I intend to go over land on foot with that thing, I need to be able to move it and I need to be able to move myself without it just crushing my spirit just to get myself from point A to point B. So you're, you're right, man. Some sort of, I don't have two hours every day to spend in the gym. My goal is three days a week. My girlfriend's goal is three days a week. We don't always hit our goals. A pro tip, if you want to force yourself to get a little bit more exercise, an easy way to do that is to get three dogs because they have to go out <laughs> several times a day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think uh that's true. I think uh one of the times where I had two dogs, two two Weimaraners at the same time and that definitely forced me to get out more because otherwise they were just going to be in my business constantly. So, uh so moving <laughs> on from physical fitness, what would you say would be another area that people should focus their attention in becoming competent? You know, one one other thing I would throw on physical fitness is dental health because I've had mm. uh, I've had a dental emergency, and uh, even if you're unable to get to the dentist for 24 hours, you're going to be pretty friggin' miserable um, if if you're not seeing a dentist on a regular basis or have dental problems. I would say get on top of that stuff, take care of your damn teeth. Um, anyway, so, side side rant there. Um, <laughs> you sound like my wife, but uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say the next thing is some sort of actual professional training as a driver of a motor vehicle. And I stole this one from a guy named Sherman House. Dr. Sherman House wrote a paper that became very, very popular called The Civilian Defender. And he had eight bullet point things that everyone who's a competent civilian defender uh, should need to know. And I'll, I'll send you a link to his article on that. And this was one of his that doesn't come up in any self-defense training really at all. I, I agree with him. I think this is one of the most important things you can train yourself to do. We're all driving several thousand pound potential weapons. Uh, we all have thousand pound potential weapons coming at us for at least most of us half an hour a day, mm -hmm. 45 minutes a day. Um, but none of us have had any training on it since high school. And we all think we're good. We all think we're above average. Um, this is something we do every single day that is a life and death threat, potentially. Uh, and then some sort of professional training and defensive driving, probably massively more likely to need that than you are to actually need any sort of firearm skills. Uh, yet people pay. I, I do it. And I love the edutainment classes. Mm -hmm. um, I love going to shooting courses because they're fun. They're not as fun as driving courses or 
they're probably more fun, more attainable, and less expensive than driving courses. So I go to more shooting courses. But uh, I've been to two five day professional driving courses. I think these are incredibly important, man. And then we put some sort of bug out or uh, you know mass evacuation on top of this. You're probably massively more likely to need good, solid defensive driving skills and just in your day to day life. But I think this is probably one of the most overlooked training segments in the in the self defense community or preparedness community. I would 100% agree with that. And I will even call myself out. Like it was something that I know in my original list of things I wanted to learn, that was one of them. And I remember at that time, it was really, really very difficult to find anybody teaching any of it. Um, and I think there at that time, because this was a while back, there was like one school out in Las Vegas or something. And it was, it was really expensive, even in the comparison of like, like shooting classes and stuff like you were getting up there. And, but I think it, that was a different time. And so it's probably expanded more uh, and more people teaching it. I mean, I actually know a few a few more people teaching it now than than I used to. So but you're right. That is a huge thing. And it's it's something that uh, I'm glad you said it because I just kind of called myself out on it, that uh, that it's something I need to readdress because I did get caught up in so many other things and never really got into that. I got into it some but it was more academic and it was not hands-on and it wasn't in a formal setting. And I, you know, I, I was very fortunate that both of the courses that I attended were paid for by the United States government. So mm -hmm. it, really easy for me to go to, but uh, there, yeah, there definitely are some courses out there. Uh, Bill Scott racing. I don't know if you want to throw out names sure. on here, but Bill Scott racing BSR is the one that I'm most familiar with. and tremendously nice facility purpose built for what they do um you can do off road overland training there i think but i'm pretty sure their uh primary focus is the you know the high speed j turns and it's 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 fun stuff man I, i'm not gonna i'm not gonna tell you it's just a serious training course uh -huh. it is but it's also very fun <laughs> so what's next on the list here uh, medical knowledge, which I'm not going to beat up, man. You've had much more qualified people on here uh, than me, but I, I think medical knowledge is really, really important. I, again, I am massively more likely to encounter an automobile accident or a person in cardiac distress than I am to be in an active shooter situation or have someone rob me at gunpoint or whatever. Uh, there's a very real likelihood, a much more real likelihood that I will have to put medical knowledge to use than I will uh, self-defense knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I don't discount self-defense stuff, but uh, just, just looking at what's more likely versus less likely, I think everyone should have, I don't know, maybe um, I go back and listen to your no BS first aid for everybody episode mm -hmm. that like, I, I really, really enjoyed that guy's take on it. And for the last year I've been saying, ah, I need to, I need to go back to an EMT course. I used to have my EMT certification and let it lapse and lost it. And I don't know, that guy almost changed my mind, man, because he, one thing he points out that I really, really loved is, yeah, you could go to medical school and, and be a friggin' surgeon if you want. Yeah. But if the grid goes down and you don't have an operating room and you can't ventilate this person and keep their heart pumping and whatever else, it doesn't really matter. Um, so. Basically, I have first aid is kind of to get someone to a higher level of, of care. Everyone should have some basic knowledge and probably some basic equipment. But I think I think knowledge first and foremost. Yeah. And I think that medical stuff is definitely one of those areas, like we were saying earlier, where it's it's good to be a generalist. And like if yeah, if it interests you, you can go as far as you want to with it. But to have that basic level of competency and even we'd throw in there which we threw in that episode a lot of reasonable competency which is you know how much time and effort do you have to put into it what are you expecting and what is a realistic outcome based on severity of injuries because most medicine these days even in wilderness uh emt is stabilizing people long enough to get them to a higher level of care if you're talking about really serious injuries I totally agree with that, man. And that's hammered home. It's It's been several years since I took the EMT course too, but that was hammered home. Definitive care, definitive care, definitive care. You're just trying to keep that person alive long enough to get them to a hospital. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, back to the gear thing, um, you know, I, I could give you a hospital's worth of equipment and, you know, turn my dog loose and tell my dog to treat you. And my dog's probably not going to get very far at <laughs> taking care of your injuries. Uh -huh. uh, on the other hand, you could give a paramedic nothing and say, treat this person. And they could probably, they could probably make some, some stuff happen. Mm. Uh, just improvising on the fly with what they have available. Um, knowledge first, man. And that pretty much goes for all of this stuff, but um, knowledge before equipment, especially when it comes to medical stuff. Mm -hmm. What do we got next on this list? I think some unarmed combative stuff is, is important. And I listened to an interview uh, on another podcast with Cecil Birch, who runs a, I, I don't know him. I've never been to any of his training, but he runs a company called Immediate Action Combatives. It's basically this gun grappling system. And one thing I, he said that I found really interesting is this is kind of gaining acceptance. Ten years ago, if you'd gone on a gun forum and said, oh, you need some combatives, all the gun guys would have been like, nope, I got a gun. Mm. Don't need any of that. Or if you'd gone to a martial arts forum and said, you guys need some gun training, they'd have been like, no, screw you. Like, I've got this. And now there's starting to be this crossover. I think it's becoming a little bit more accepted that. Everybody probably needs some empty hand skills. And I like this because, again, you can take away everything from me and I still have something. I am the weapon, you know, a firearm, a knife, a stick, a rock is just a tool. Ultimately, I am the, you know, I'm the person that's going to wield that, whether it's a rock in my hand that I beat you over the head with or a gun that throws a rock very, very fast at you. Um, I, I want to train my body to be the weapon. And this is probably the single biggest thing on here that. Uh, that I fail at. I was a I was a combatives instructor in the military, um, and I haven't really touched it since then. To be honest, mm -hmm. uh, I need to. I definitely got some self improvement to do here. Well, and but I think that's one of those things. And since you were an instructor, this this might be an interesting area to to go down a rabbit hole for a second. In is it as much of a diminishing skill as shooting? Because I know even I've been bad about it. I've been out of the dojo for a few years now. Um, and it goes back to one of those things, you know, being a generalist and having the time to do things. What do you find it is as much of a diminishing skill as, say, shooting to put it in context for people? I guess it depends on where you're at with it. So I, I had the opportunity to interview a dude who was kind of an expert on myelinization and how, like, how the brain works. This was for an article I was writing about dry practice several years ago. And this dude was basically like, once you've myelinated those pathways to a certain point and achieved like this concept known as mastery, and it is kind of analogous to that 10,000 hours thing to bring us back around to the top of the show. Um, once you have achieved what is recognized as true mastery of a skill, be it hammering a nail, playing a violin, shooting a gun, uh, whatever it is, that skill, skills degrade. But that skill will never degrade past about 80% of your peak performance. So at any mm. point, if you if you bang nails for 30 years, you could take 20 years off, pick up a hammer, and be probably better than most people banging those nails. So I think that's kind of where I got with shooting in the military. I did a ton of pistol shooting, probably probably 100,000 rounds of 40, uh, 45 under like this intense training environment. And it was competitive with you know all your teams. You know, people are going to yell at you if you didn't do good enough. You might get dropped. There's all these elements creating this atmosphere where you learn stuff really, really well. I don't think I ever got to that point with uh, with any kind of martial art or empty hand combatives. I think it's possible to do that, but I have not. I, I'm not even close to that. Mm -hmm. So probably. Yeah, probably I get my butt kicked right now by just about <laughs> anybody. Well, and I guess it does also depend. It's it's context, and this goes back to competent versus expert. Is you know who are we talking about? You're going up against, so it makes sense. Um, so less lethal options. Uh, God, man, I I wrote a wrote an article on my revolver blog a few months back about pepper spray, and I think we might have talked about this in the last episode yeah, too, but. Yeah, just like everybody else, man, I completely disregarded this. And now I am a convert. There's a can of pepper spray in my car. There's like one in all of my coat pockets. There's pepper spray everywhere around my house. Now, I wrote this article and people in the comments are like, ah, yeah, maybe I'll start doing that. There wasn't this enthusiastic like, yeah, man, I am dropping the ball on this. I need to get on it. And I can't figure out why. Well, 
it's just not as cool as guns. It's just not as cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so guns, um, I'll be honest, man, I love shooting the rifle. I love rifle courses, carbine courses. I love, you know, turning, turning money into noise with my AR 15. Mm-hmm. But, uh, I think, uh, I think probably about 95% of the effort needs to be focused on whatever your carry handgun is. It's, it's fun to shoot the other guns to the desert Eagle and what, and what, I don't know, whatever you got, but, uh-huh. Uh, that M and P shield, that LCP, that Smith and Wesson J frame, whatever you actually carry is probably what you should be shooting at the range every stinking week. What you should be dry practicing with, and um, you know, I think that's probably what most people shoot most of the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so finally, man, like I would just say, kind of some some general life skills. Um, the ability to cook a meal sounds kind of silly until. You have bugged out to the mountains and you have killed that wild game and everything, everything in your bug out plan to go to the woods and live off the land is succeeding perfectly. And then you have that meat and you don't know what the hell to do with it. The ability to actually clean an animal and turn it into something that you can put in your body for fuel, uh, I think is pretty important. Things like sewing, things like the ability to build and maintain a fire. Um, I've referenced this a couple of times before in maybe on podcast, maybe in just conversations with you, but I have a friend that's super into prepping, really smart guy, really knowledgeable guy. He spends a lot of money on equipment. And I was like, when's the last time you built a fire? And he's like, Oh, I don't know, man. It's probably been, I don't know, 10 years. Um, that's probably not the right answer. Uh, Mm -hmm. that's one of those really, really basic life skills. Um, the ability, you know, just general knowledge, um, I I would take someone with a really, really broad background over an expert in nuclear physics because that person with a broad background can probably look at, you know, probably has a little bit of of mechanical ability, maybe knows a little bit about electricity, a little bit about plumbing, carpentry, whatever it is, eclectic, liberal arts kind of background is is useful for more than just a a useless degree on your wall. Um, (laughs) I'm sorry to anybody that has liberal arts, but like, I I think that's a really useful thing, man. And Mm -hmm. I think there, there is a reason that, 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 that was the original idea for colleges to, or university is to expose you to all these different things, because I think it influences thought thought processes and creativity and, you know, creativity sounds kind of lame on a prepper podcast, but um, creativity in a, in a situation where you don't have a lot of equipment to work with, you don't have a lot of supplies or resources. Creativity is a really, really good thing to have. Yeah. Well, and I think that's so like creativity, innovation, uh, any of those things in that improvisation, that's what I was looking for. Any of those things in that moment. I mean, it's, you know, improvisation is, is generally known as to be a huge thing. And I think, but what most people don't realize is improvisation requires a lot of creativity. So anything you can do to get as many areas of knowledge to supplement that, that, uh, your ability to improvise and then to spur on the creativity. It's that's going to be the driving force of being able to improvise. Yeah, totally agree, man. Um, yeah, being, being able to look at, well, these are the five things I have. None of them have anything to do with the situation that I'm facing, but how can I turn this into something that's going to make my life easier or going to get me out of this jam or, whatever the case may be. Couldn't agree more. Mm. So what, what did I miss, man? What do you got? I think that's it. I think, you know, to, to segue us out here a little bit, I know, uh, speaking of becoming competent in things, you guys, I mean, that's, that's y'all's thing is a sampling of life and a sampling of, uh, of interesting skills. And one of the ones that you covered recently is, uh, is going to be, uh, homebrewing. And this to me, it's like if I didn't have 10 million other things going on, home brewing and mead making and all this other stuff is something I would love to get into. Actually, I'd really love to get into distilling if it wasn't, you know, it didn't eventually involve, you know, federal charges for some <laughs> bizarre, stupid ass reason. But um, but yeah, so tell us about that. Like and this was one. This was funny because we were talking a little bit. There's a lot of people that listen to the show that I know that that are into mead making. Um, and you said you had looked into it, but you were like, for a little bit more effort, you got into homebrewing. But tell us about that. Tell us about the episode and just what what is your take on and and what has been the takeaway for you in getting into homebrewing? Not that that's what y'all show about. Y'all cover all kinds of stuff, but over at Across the Creek, this is this is what's going on right now. 
Yeah. So we, yeah, that episode about homebrewing just came out a week, maybe two weeks ago. And it's one of my favorite episodes. I, I did start out with mead because it's real simple. Take some honey, pour it in some water and put some yeast in it and wait. Uh, and I rocked with that for maybe a, a couple of months, made several different batches. And then I discovered I don't really like mead all that much. It, it's okay. It's, it's fun when you make it, but um, it, it was more kind of a novelty. And then I looked into brewing beer and found out that it's really not that much more difficult. Um, there's kind of a spectrum you can be on of I'm going to do extract brewing and follow the recipe to the letter and you will turn out some pretty good beer, some pretty economically priced beer. We that that's our primary motivation is we we love beer. We tour a lot of breweries. We drink a lot of beer. So this actually saves us money. We've recouped our investment in our equipment, which is only a couple hundred bucks. Um, if you're if you're making mead, you don't really need much more than what you already have. So, uh, yeah, my girlfriend and I, this might be a little more difficult if she weren't into it, but mm. she loves it just as much as I do. So it's it's a really, really good thing for us. And uh, yeah, that episode just kind of talks about, you know, kind of why you might want to think about brewing your own beer, uh, the legality of it, because there is a little bit of legality still. And then we kind of step through the process. Very cool, man. Well, tell tell the audience one more time, what is the name of your show and how can they find it? That is Across the Peak. You can find that at acrossthepeak.com, iTunes, Google, or Android uh, pod, podcast store environment <laughs> thing, whatever uh, you guys have. Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, Awesome. Well, Justin, as always, dude, thank you for being on today and uh, helping us uncover what is confident. Thank you, man. Show notes, links, and resources from this episode can be found by going to in the rabbithole.com slash E286. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, just look down in the description section below. And speaking of YouTube, if you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to do all that YouTube stuff. Throw us a like, subscribe, and slap that bell around because bananas are yellow. With that, we wrap up episode number 286 from the Lone Star State. Till next time, stay safe and sound.